Finally, an answer to the age-old question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg roll? Easy. Just eat whichever one's closest. The Sensation Salad and Filet Sandwich Meal are back at Zaxby's. Both feature our famous hand-breaded chicken, crispy wontons, Asian slaw, and citrus vinaigrette. And each comes with its very own egg roll. For a limited time, only at Zaxby's. Prime with fried pickles while supplies last. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It is Wake Up Warchant, proudly presented by Zaxby's. It's still Miami week! Thankfully, only for like 48 more hours, then we can move on with our lives and look forward to Jackson State or Jacksonville State winning a football game. That would be great. I'm Aslan. Corey's here as well. We work for Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source. Use that promo code Warchant30 for the latest and greatest information on all Seminole athletics. Corey, it's Friday. We're going to do a little over-under. Well, it's actually Thursday as we record this, but it's a Friday show. We're going to do a little over-under. I'm one up on you. Hope you're not too discouraged. Going to give away some uh, free Zaxby's, T-shirts. Fun times. How excited are you for the uh, for the following 48 hours? Um, I guess I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm always excited to think about college football, and, I, and I'm not going to take it for granted. I know some people might not be looking forward to the game because you think you know what the result will be. But still, as I said uh, last week, it's still college football. It beats not having a season. They're out there playing, so I'm going to do my best to enjoy it. That is the spirit. We will post all these over-unders on the Tribal Council. Submit your picks. If you win, I'll have you direct message me on War Chan or email me. Provide your name, like your real-life birth given name. That way, I don't have to go to the post office. And, uh, and obviously your address, oh, uh, yeah. the last four digits of the social, or the whole thing? Ha, 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 ha. Sorry. But seriously, though, I'm going into a post office with these nondescript manila envelopes with no name on it and right. just a street address i'm a middle eastern guy i'm bearded i'm masked just and it says really weird the, the, the name is like at noel 11 <laughs> is who you're sending it to big no. daddy noel <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving it blank man i'm like yeah. I, i'm like I'm not that's gonna, even worse you that's at least should put like their at their uh moniker on there I don't know. Just I figured that would be really. I don't know. Um, like who knows? Maybe they maybe they keep this secret from their wives. They don't want their wives to know that they're you know Big Daddy Noel, 1945 or whatever. Right. Uh, so just trying to respect everyone's privacy. Uh, shoot me your name though, so I can at least put it on the envelope. Uh, it would make things a little less awkward. I would appreciate it. All right, Corey. Uh, before we get to over under though, let's talk a little bit about this game that's coming up. It's Miami at 7:30 down in Miami Gardens. Hard Rock Stadium, Miami riding a three-game winning streak into this game. It's going to be interesting. Mike Norvell will not be there. Uh, he'll be, we're thinking, we're assuming, from his the comfort of his house. But also somebody very important to Florida State won't be there either. For I That's know, right. You know, I, so. won't be, I won't be there as well. It'll be the first Miami game that I've missed um, since, I guess, 06. I, that was before I was at the Democrat, so I was uh, I was not I wasn't going to Florida State Miami games back then. So uh, that would be the last one I think I missed was the uh, the O six game down there. I think that was a Monday nighter, mm. where the final was like thirteen to ten. It was one of those great Weatherford. Yeah. Um, who did he battle with? Kyle Wright. Who was who was he going to war with in those thirteen to 10, 10, 7 games? Was it Robert Marr? That was before Robert Marv arrived, right? One of those nondescript Miami quarterbacks, which there were they have been plentiful. Uh, since uh, Ken Dorsey left. Um, but yes, also besides me not being there and you not being there, uh, Gene Deckerhoff won't be there. He'll be uh, broadcasting uh, from a remote location in Tallahassee as uh, for the first time in his career. He's been calling Florida State games since 1979. This will be the first game he's not actually there calling the game. That's cr- so how is this going to work then? Well, so um, I think originally they had decided to do Seminole, go to the Seminole Productions booth. They're going to get like a live feed from the production truck, from the ABC production truck. So it's not the feed that we see, 
that the the regular fan sees. It's a live feed, so they can broadcast the game live, so they don't have the they don't de- deal with the seven or ten second delay that we get. Like I don't know if you guys noticed that maybe you have. I'm sure some of you are younger and don't do this, but back in the day, a lot of people would would turn their radio on to listen to Deckerhoff, but watch the game, watch the broadcast. Well, he's he's at the stadium and he's broadcasting live, so he's like eight seconds ahead of what you're seeing on TV. Um, but that won't be the case. They won't be watching the the. I guess that's for cussing, right? Or yeah, if somebody yeah. runs across the field with with Streakers, with no clothes yeah. on, yeah. Okay, crazy. So they have that delay to protect our you know delicate sensibilities. So uh, so he he won't be watching that feed necessarily. He'll be watching the TV feed, but the live feed from the from the truck that's on site, and they'll be broadcasting from the uh, apparently from the home booth at Dope Campbell Stadium, the home radio booth at Dope Campbell Stadium, which is going to be a weird scene, right? Like. Tom Block, William Floyd, and Gene Deckerhoff in this empty stadium. Like, nobody else is in the building. The lights in the press box are on, but nothing else. And they're watching the TV to call the game. But that's that's 2020, baby. Think they'll think they'll interview – you think Tom Block will interview Mike Norvell at half, like walking from his kitchen, grabbing snacks back to his office? Yeah, I should ask Tom. Like, maybe like he'll FaceTime. just be in Norvell's driveway. And at halftime, Norvell just comes out of the dri- out of his house – Tom's got the boom mic like they do for the NBA games. And he just, hey, coach, from six feet away, he asked him what he thought of the first half. That wouldn't be a – you should do that. Yeah, we'll Norvell's see. open to the media, man. Like, you should ask if you could go do that, if you could go talk to him at halftime. Uh, all right, I'll see what I can do. What, what else is he going to be doing? I don't know, man. Just Hayes in the barn. He can't do it. Yeah, he can't do anything from his from his couch. Uh, so, yeah, Dekarov did do this for the for the first Buccaneers game. He was He was in Tampa with his partner down there, Dave Moore, broadcasting the Saints Bucks game that was being played in New Orleans. So he's done it once before. Uh not a huge fan, but he understands it. You know what I mean? Read the story. I won't get into more. Um it's on War Champ, but also uh he isn't all that upset that it's at Hard Rock Stadium because that is as you know, were you there two years ago? Yeah. We yeah. were all there. We we're all there. I mean it's it's, it's a family. it's just an awful place <laughs> to watch a football game. And especially and if you're working, I mean nobody and not that anybody cares. But the press box is like in the corner. It's like behind home plate for the Marlins games. Yeah. Do they even play the Marlins games there anymore? No, they got Marlins Park now, man. Yeah, they so started... they don't even play there. But it's they put the press box where the home where where it was behind home plate for the baseball games. But then you're you know you're in the corner of an end zone trying to watch, which is fine, whatever. You, you, nobody's going to play a violin for us. We're there for free, so big deal. I end up having to watch half the game on the TV above me anyway to see what yard line it is. But Gene, he said the radio booth is even worse. It's in the actual end zone. It's like behind the goalpost. And it's, he said it's a broom closet. Like they just don't, you know, he's like, they just don't care about the radio. Pe- and he said that it's the same for the Dolphins guys and the Hurricanes guys. Like they just, they don't care at all about the, the radio folks. So, I, I think this is the one that will probably hurt the least for Gene not being there because it's such an awful venue anyway. The mecca of American sports cities, Miami, Florida, everybody. Mm-hmm. Drink Absolutely. it in. AP headline from 2006, number 11 FSU stifles number 12 Miami in second half for opening win. Florida State scored 13, no, I'm sorry, 10 unanswered points to win that game. Shut them out, 10-0 in the fourth quarter. Yeah, who was the Mason. quarterback? Who were the quarterbacks? It was uh, Drew Weatherford and Kyle Wright. You were right. Oh, okay. Kyle nice. Wright. I believe Buster Davis had a big game that day. Like, he kind of – he became like a household name that game. Uh, maybe Timmons. Timmons would have been on that team too, yeah. Um, so, they had some linebackers, man. Florida State had some linebackers back then. Dakota Fag, three catches, 60 yards. Look at that. Joe Surratt. Carrying the rock. All right. Good times. All the great names. You'll Good be hearing times. all these names in the when the in FSU Hall of Fame inductions. Uh, well, Dakota Fag at least will always have the uh Alabama the, game. The Alabama game yeah. in the house that Xavier built. That was uh, an all time great moment. Saban killer State football. The Saban That's right. killer, Dakota Fag. That's right. It feels like that was the last game Alabama lost. <laughs> but it, it did happen. I was there. I saw it in person. Uh, was there as well. All right, let's talk about this game then. So Miami, Florida State, 730, Saturday, Hard Rock, you know everything. Uh, most everybody that's listening to the show because you're, you're that pumped up and you're that dialed into everything. What I did find interesting with Gene speaking, Gene Williams, that is, aka.com, speaking to Gary Furman from Kane Sport, and I kind of touched upon this on the show yesterday, was just the fact that their defense is, is middle of the road right now with you know, 52 or 54 teams having qualified for being ranked statistically by the NCAA. Like, they're allowing 400 yards of offense a game. 
you mentioned Javian Hawkins might be the best ACC player offensively, not named Trevor Lawrence, so we should perhaps use that to gauge things. But you can you can spend two weeks hammering home just how important it is, it is going to be to run the football. And I know you might be talking more about quarterback run, but I just think like Webb, Corbin, those guys, your offensive line, it it's doesn't you know the certain principles keys to victory remain the same in most every game. But if if they can establish some semblance of a run game, Florida State, like would that be like the one single thing outside of I guess maybe quarterback play? If you were told, hey, like here's a menu of things I can get, offer you, Corey, like you know better pass rush, better coverage, um, more three and outs, or a more robust running game, like would the running game be the number one thing you think would be an indicator of Florida State's chances to pull off the upset if it's successful? Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned the two that I think are the biggest is that and then the the pass rush. Uh, but if we want to keep it on offense, absolutely. Um, I just, it didn't look feasible in the first game. But again, it was one game. They just, it wasn't like you saw, I know Corbin and Webb didn't wow us, but it's not like you saw a lot of huge lanes that they just missed or one cut and they're gone and they just got tripped up. You didn't see a lot of that. So I, I just don't, I would be surprised if you did see it now. You know what I mean? Like if all of a sudden that did happen. Um, but again, I just, I won't even, I, I, I just keep, keep harping on the same things. If they know that the quarterback isn't going to keep it, then I don't think you have any chance to run um, out of the sets they were running out of or trying to run whether it was the pistol or whether it was the uh, just the in the shot going the running back next to him. If they know the quarterback isn't a threat to keep the ball, it's just going to be hard, man. It's going to be hard for your five to block their four or five or seven in the box. So, 52 teams, by the way, uh, or have played a football game, FBS football game, 52 teams. Houston okay. will not be one of them. Uh, but, yeah, so their total defense, 29th in the country. They're allowing 400 yards. Rushing defense, 28th. They're allowing a little bit over 144 yards. But I, as we all know, that that is a small sample size. Like, you know, that doesn't mean their defense is going to be that bad. Like, what would Florida State have been ranked in rushing defense in 2013 after the Boston College game? Yeah. Like, teams do get better. They make adjustments. And also, I'm telling you, man, that guy is electric. That dude – and they're, the Louisville quarterback, I don't think he had a lot of yards rushing or even attempts – but he is a guy that you have to keep an eye on in the running game. Um, and that does take attention away, divert attention away from the 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 back the, the running backs. So that that's a luxury that Florida State doesn't have. They don't have Hawkins, who's awesome. And as of now, as we stand, as we sit here talking on a Friday before the game, we don't know what kind of running threat they're going to have at quarterback. Devontae Love Taylor was at FIU last year when they upended Miami. He graded out at 78.8 as an offensive player. He was a 77.4 pass blocking grade, 75.9 run blocking. Okay. I think that gives you a little bit of hope too. I mean, he's played against them, can probably give you some some optimism, coach up the guys on the front end, uh, let them know what they were able to do to be successful. So that, that has me feeling maybe a little bit hopeful. Uh, obviously, the quarterback, the, the number one thing for the offense. How much of this, and we haven't really talked about it a lot, and I, it's such a weird thing, I, I think, to discuss, just the, the whole you know the rivalry aspect. A lot of it is obviously because Florida State's been on the wrong end of it here the last few years. You don't maybe feel all that optimistic going into it on Saturday. Maybe it's the playoff era where, you know, everything's all about making the playoffs, so rivalries kind of lose their, their oomph. Most of it, though, is the fact that you're unranked, you're 0-1, and you're going up against a team that you don't think you're going to win. But, like, in terms of emotion – and I know everyone tries to get those sort of questions and answers out of players and coaches in the lead-up to this. You know, Kenny Dillingham and Mike Norvell and Chris Thompson can talk about how special the rivalry is and everything, but I don't really know if you can really truly fully appreciate it until you actually played or you've, you've lived it. So into, into that regard, and this sounds probably really hokey, but we got to fill a show somehow. What do you think or who do you think is most likely to sort of step up their performance from what we saw week one to week two as a segment? Like I really want to, I really want to see something big out of the defensive line, and I know we, that goes to pass rush maybe first and foremost for so many people. But man, like th this is like Odell's game. This is Odell's, you know, DNA playing this team. The rivalry aspect. It's his guys. They're arguably the most talented players at their position on this entire roster. If those guys can stuff the Miami run game, if those guys 
can collapse the pocket on De'Ara King. Maybe defensively, that's the one singular thing that can really shift this game. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely much better than what Miami has faced so far this season. Even even if they played pedestrian or mediocre against Georgia Tech, this is still those defensive tackles are still the best that Miami's faced. Uh, and they don't have great ones either, apparently, on their team. So it's not like they get to face great ones in practice. So you should control the middle of the line of scrimmage. But <laughs> that's only a fraction of the football field. Like, you hope you can control other parts of the scrimmage besides that finite six-foot space right around the center. If you're controlling that, that's great. That beats the alternative. But you still got some other problem areas. Yeah, I would say, you, if you're talking about segments, I, you know, I would even, we know what the ends are, man. Like, we just, uh, we're not expecting a ton out of them. But if the defensive tackles can at least dominate their their plays and their men, that could make a that could make a pretty big impact. I don't know if it's enough to slow them down or stop them, but it makes a pretty big impact because they didn't they they were the defensive tackles were okay in the opener, but nothing special. They're gonna have to be special on Saturday night. And I think the receivers will have to be too. I, I think those are the two that you hope I don't know if it has anything to do with the emotion of the game or playing in Miami, um as much as just they were bad in week one. And so step up and be play with some pride. Play, play, show people who you really are and get, you know, watch that away because, you know, for two weeks, everybody's been talking about two drops from Warren Thompson and one drop from Tamari and Terry. So get that out of their system and go make plays and throw Keyshawn Helton the ball more. Get him the ball somehow. That would be nice. I was going to say, though, when you're talking about the emotion, man, it is going to be different. Like, I'm sure they're excited to play Miami because it's Miami. Number one, we don't know who's eligible and who's uh, not eligible, who's available and who's not from either team because they don't release that kind of stuff. So Ira will be have his binoculars on at 6.30 or 6.15 to see who's warming up and letting everybody know this guy's not here, this guy's dressed, uh, everything else. But there's going to be I, – I keep coming to the number. Is it 9,000, 10,000? How many fans the, are going to be there? I mean, that sounds about right. I don't have the exact Because number. I don't even think it's the 20% that, that Doak has. Um, by the way, there were some adjustments there and what they're going to do for fans at their home games moving forward, which – I don't quite understand why it took getting embarrassed on national TV. And look, you can think what you want about the mask and whether you should wear them or not. I'm not here for that debate. Um, you should, but I'm not here for that debate. But um, it was mandatory. That's what it said on the ticket. That's what it said to get in the game. It's mandatory that you wear a mask. That's what it said on the slow. That's what it said on the graphic on ESPN as they're showing a crowd full of people without masks on. Yeah. So that was an embarrassment for Florida State. So it obviously meant something to Coburn. It obviously meant something to Thrasher because they've they've sent strongly worded emails, and now I think all students have to be have a negative test to get into the game, um, and the Ooh. the masking is going to be required, Let's and it's go. going to be enforced. Let's go, now, John Thrasher. Let's go. Who's this how guy? Are, how are they going to enforce it? Who knows? But apparently they're they're laying down the law, and the mask mandate will be enforced with the students moving forward. We'll see. But anyway. Um, so, but going back to the Miami game, so if there's 10,000 people there, man, you've been to those games. And that was 2018, yeah. even. That wasn't 2002. That wasn't 2013 or 1991. It's still, man, you feel it when you go into the game. Even if Miami's terrible in Florida State, like the 14 game, the 12 game, all those games, they just feel different. There is a different feel. I know that's a cliche, but it's true. There's an energy when those two teams are on the field in front of a full stadium that it just gets you a little more amped up. And you see it every single year, no matter who the players are. Well, buddy, when there's 9,000 or 10,000 people in the stands and they're spread out and it's not 70 or 80, it's going to be a different feel. It's not going to have as much juice. So it really will be which team can handle, I think which team can handle that better. Like, you know, you just, you can't feed off the emotion of the crowd because there's not going to be much. You know, they're going to pipe in noise. Great. It's still going to be, the, the, I think the energy in the crowd is going to be, what, one-sixth, one-seventh of what it normally is. Yeah, Florida State's kind enough in their game notes to show you what the capacity of their stadium is typically and then what it is uh, due to the pandemic. Miami has not uh, done so. So I so, yeah, can't, can't figure out how many people will be in attendance. Although I should probably see how much the tickets cost right now to see how much I'm potentially going to owe That's you right. here. That's um, right. But as you were saying that, I'm trying to like look up a whole bunch of things here. Uh, you mentioned receivers, which is you know somebody that really underperformed for Florida State against a less than stellar Georgia Tech team. 
you know, Miami actually, they've graded out at 56 in coverage, which is not good. That is 36th out of the 52 teams who have played. So uh, such luminaries as North Texas, Georgia Tech, and Western Kentucky actually have better rated coverage units, defensive backs coverage, than Miami. Florida State, 28th. So as bad as we thought we looked, me saying we looked, um, maybe not as bad as uh, Miami. So that gives yeah. to more interior the opportunity. I, I just wonder if they really do kind of embrace the fact that this is such a redemptive game for them. I don't know if, if we can measure that, but the disappointment, the people losing interest in following the team right now and, 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 and just, you know, your coach has got COVID, all these things that just are not helping you really want to play your best game maybe, put your best foot forward. There's a lot of excuses that are being thrown your way to maybe pack it in and not play to your full capability. But like if they can actually put this together, not completely, not full 60 minutes, but if some of these units, if some of these segments, if they can hit a couple of these plays where all 11 guys are doing their job, it's not out of the realm of possibility to put stress on Miami and have them uh, have to play 60 minutes and then who knows what could happen in a game like this if a guy like Terry can break off a big, a big catch and run, if Marvin Wilson can collapse the pocket a few times, if Robert Cooper can, can help slow down Miami's run game. I, just, I hope that everyone kind of realizes no matter how sort of downtrodden you feel going to this game, it still is the Miami game. Everything can turn around any Saturday – and this is the best opportunity for you right now. You got two weeks to get prepared. They're probably going to go into it overconfident. We haven't talked too much about the fact that they've got a bye week next week, and after that's Clemson. So maybe they have an, an eye looking ahead to Clemson. So there's a couple things working maybe in Florida State's favor. But I just hope more than anything, Chris Thompson and Mike Norvell really let them know that, man, like junk week one, it can all change now. And then they have the, the, the potential to pull off the upset. Wouldn't it be nice if they could get the other Chris Thompson back? Just sprinkle him into the backfield for about 12 or 15 carries. That would be pretty sweet. Uh, he owns that place, man. Well, that's not quite true. He did have those two long runs back-to-back because -back of the penalty, but then he also tore his ACL there in 2012. So not a, not all great memories for him in Hard Rock. But I just looked it up. It is 13,000 fans. Ooh. That's how many will be there. All right. So and not, uh, a, not a ton, you know, not a ton. Right now, the cheapest ticket on StubHub is $84 for the game so 84 so you owe me 19 bucks there we go we're all right it came close. down from 91 yeah we're getting close i'll try to pull up the uh not that people care all that much but hey i get to i i, I look at me look at me i'm the captain now um i'm trying to see I, I did take the screenshot right before kickoff last week just so i had some sort of comparison here and Florida State, right before kickoff, $24 was the cheapest ticket for the Georgia Tech game. So I'm just hoping I'm going to come in the last minute, swoop in, and get under that $65 threshold and be able to pat myself on the back of it. I don't feel like that's fair. I feel like it should at least you should lock and load by, like, tomorrow night. You can't wait until people are giving away because it's, it's, ah, the kickoff what, is four oh, minutes what away. You can't, what are you moving the goalposts well, over here for? What are you, you going to be in Tallahassee at Saturday at 445 and be like, oh, man, I can get a ticket for 45 bucks. Let's go. Yeah. We can get there by the third quarter. Well, the whole come point on, was man. You, you come to a game and you – after the 2002 Sugar Bowl, I will quite literally never buy a ticket beforehand. I will scalp. Because I remember I was so worried for some stupid – this is the first time I ever really bought tickets because I had student tickets growing up or my family or my friends' families would take me out to a game. I'd have to worry about tickets. But the 2002 Sugar Bowl against Georgia, like I went on eBay and bought three tickets for my buddies, and it was like 200-something dollars. It was a little bit over $70 per ticket. And there was like five of us that went, two didn't have tickets. They ended up scalping for like $20 right before kickoff, and, I mean, you're in college, $50 swing, that's that's life and death for like a month of right. drinking practically. Right. So pretty much from then on, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do this any longer. I did buy them beforehand for the national championship game just because there was such high demand uh, for that first sort of like three weeks after the matchup was announced, but that, that, that ticket started plummeting as well. I mean, we saw people scalping for well below face value. But that's the way to do it, man. If you're going to be around for a game or even you're going to go down to Miami, yeah, go get your hotel and then just pretty much know that you could walk around the stadium and pretty much name your price 10 minutes before kickoff or so. So that's all I was trying to advocate when people were worried about having to spend hundreds of dollars on tickets. I just didn't think right. that was going to be the case. All right. all right. Well, that said, let's get to the over the unders. He's come from the Williams Sportsbook. 
Coldest beer in town, brightest televisions in town. I'm currently one up on Corey. Uh, we were in agreement or in agreement on everything other than the over under for Emmett Rice's tackles. I think it was like six and a half. I said under, you said over. That was the determining factor. He had like four or three tackles. Mm-hmm. Well, that said, first one, Tamorian Terry catches seven and a half. Corey Clark over, under. Hey. That's a big number, man. Like eight catches. That's. But he had five in the opener and really had, you know, there was six that should have been there. Um, yeah, I'm going to say under. That is, a, that is a big number. I think it's going to be close, though. I would not be stunned if he had eight or nine. It does, he's not one of those guys, though, that has like 13 in a game. He's usually, like, his big games are like five for 140, not, yeah. uh, not 13 for 180 or something like that. He's not like the Rashad Green that can have a, a 10 or 11 catch game. So I'm going to say under, but I, I like what Gene's thinking there. New day. I'm going, I'm, I'm taking the over. I'm taking the over on it. I lured oh, you into that's the trap. A lot of ca- yeah, I you sure did. And yeah. uh, sliding right in there. Yeah, I think we saw on that one drive, like they went back-to-back plays throwing him wide receiver screen passes. So I think this offense, in terms of wanting to get the ball in their playmaker's hands, I think they really have been able to kind of identify who they can rely on, even though he's one of the guys that obviously dropped a, a crucial pass. But I do think they'll find numerous ways to get him involved. And they won't necessarily be 40-yard downfield shots, but I think uh, he'll catch at least eight, hopefully. That's a pretty good – that's like a, a low key, as the kids would say, probably – weather vane indicator of how that offense is going to play right like if tomorrow terry catches eight passes you probably would say the florida state's i mean would you would you feel how confident would you feel saying the florida state's going to score over 21 points if terry has over eight catches i don't know if i'd say that at all but i would okay. say if he has if he has eight catches i'm confident that they have at least 100 yards passing <laughs> number that's, of florida state quarterback snaps by a player not named james blackman 11 and a half over like that, they hit the over in the Georgia Tech game, didn't they? I mean, yeah, but it's because uh, Travis had yeah. like seven runs and he had a, a pass attempt, and then Corbin took at least two or three snaps from the Wildcat. So I, yeah, I'm saying over. I'm hammering the over on that one. Hammering it. Let me uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. He had, is that right? Eight snaps. Does that sound right? Jordan Travis? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think he ran the ball seven times. and uh, Says he and, passed twice, five runs, one run block. Eight eight total snaps is what pro football focus gave him. So okay, Maybe one was a passing play that he turned into a run because he only yeah. had one, one attempt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, come on, Gene. I mean, William Sportsbook. You got to set a better line than that if you want to keep your doors open. I'm going to hammer <laughs> the over with you as well. I'm going to hammer the over. As well. Next one on the list, FSU's rushing average, 3.9 yards per carry. Mm. They average, See, man. in case you want to be refreshed, 3.1 yards against Georgia Tech. If I'm going to say under, but I do think there's a chance they'll pop some runs. I do think they'll have a game plan where they can do some things and, and make some plays on the, in the, on the ground, but it also takes into account sacks. So uh, that ta- yeah. that counts. If we took sacks away completely, I would hammer the over. But since it's sacks count towards rushing attempts and rushing uh, average, I'm going to take the under on that. Well, they do have a sacks adjusted rush number. So it's 3.1 traditionally. If you remove the sacks, it was actually 4.1 they average against Georgia Tech. So a whole yeah. yard. Yeah, that's a big deal. But hey, you know what? Sacks are a big deal. Quit yeah. getting sacked. Yeah, no, this is this is it right here. I mean, this is like the determining factor. Like if you think they're going to average over four yards a carry, then you think that it's going to be a football game. Like you think it's going to be a pretty competitive football. Yeah, because that means I mean, realistically, if we're talking about Florida State um, in recent years, you always have to take into account sacks and your rushing yardage. If they average over four yards per carry with sacks, that means that they're probably averaging close to five yards a carry without sacks. And if you're doing that. You're in the football game. Oh, man. There's absolutely no reason to say over, but I'm going to say over. Go for it, buddy. I like it. I like it. Man, you're all over this. You think it's going to be a shootout. I know. Crazy. Alex Mastromano punting average 45 and a half yards. 
He averaged forty eight point three against Georgia Tech. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna Ooh. The reason Ooh, I'm gonna say at, oh, look at this the amount of, of, of foresight that's going into this pick. Yeah, see, on. because I I was gonna say I'm just gonna I'm gonna hammer that because we got no reason not to believe in that guy. All he does is uh give us Aussie bombs. <laughs> but then I started thinking, okay, well what if they're like trying to pooch like if they're at the Miami forty four and they're trying to pooch them deep into their own territory. And then I, the the argument continued with myself and I said, No, Corey, they go for it on fourth down. Oh. They're not gonna be putting if it's fourth and three. They're gonna be they're gonna be going for it on fourth and three. So I am going to say uh over. I don't think he's gonna have to pooch. He's not gonna have any many pooch attempts. Okay, I like it. I like and it. And he's got a leg, man. That was obvious. All right, I'll take the over with you. I'll okay. take the over with you. We like Alex. Strong leg. Strong leg. Uh, next one is De'Eric King rushing yards, 52 and a half over under. He had uh, 83 net rush yards against UAB, nine against Louisville. So that's 40. That's an average. Uh, my quick math tells me that's an average of 46 per game. Um, that's right. I'm going to say. Oh, man. I'm going to say over. Yeah. I think that's going to be a weapon they use a lot on third downs, um, which is a really nice weapon to have. It's a luxury to have when you need third, when it's third and four, third and three, and you know your quarterback can go run for it. Um, so I think he'll run more in this game than he did against Louisville because he didn't need to. Um, so I'm going to say the over on that. But hey, man, those sacks come into play with that too now. That's right. If that's Florida right. State's just harassing them all night, if it's like Bulware and Wilson. Coming off the edges with Griffiths and McClendon, McClendon, D Mac, D Mac, and Jay Griff coming off the edge. Man, he might be running for his life all night. Yeah, uh, J Rob and Qful coming off the. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, here we go. Official. What'd you say? Oh, I Did said you say over. The over? I was over. Okay, yeah, 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 we're we're yeah. we're in agreement on a lot of these. It seems yeah. like again. Uh, we you know we've done five. We've agreed on three, and we have split on two. I mean, come on. Okay, all right. Okay. I mean, we want to. Should we skip? Should we skip Bayless and uh, Shannon Sharp this and just disagree on everything? Like script it no, all out? Nope. Uh. Uh-uh. Nope. Total points, fifty four. I mean, it's got to be under, right? I mean, if it's over, God help us. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that I mean, that's. 28-27 is over. Um 31 to 20 is under. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to say under again because I I think I predicted Miami like no, that was what I predicted the Georgia Tech game to be. I don't even know if I've thrown a prediction out there, but I'm going to say under. I'm I'm looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of like 33 to 20, 30 to 17, something like that. Okay. Not 23 to 12 though. Not 23 to 12 from the great 98 98 Florida State Florida game. Very well. Our the over-unders are set. Do post those over on the Tribal Council. I'll also try to get it onto the Twitter machine. I forgot to, but uh, I won't be at the stadium. I'll actually be in the comfort of my home uh, to watch it, so I don't have any excuses. You know what? You and, I, you and I could go to the press. Why can't we go to the press box, too? <laughs> Just sit in our normal seats and watch the game on TV like that. Because it's going to be, gosh, with only two bodies in there, with that AC running, it's going to be an igloo. Well, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I wonder if they realize that, how cold it's going to be. I should text Tom Block back and be like, God, buddy, you better wear a parka. (laughs) Oh, hey, before we go, just want to send a shout out. Uh, He commented on the podcast yesterday, the Renegade Express edition. It came from Big Steve-O22. Uh, said, morning, fellas. Hope all is well. Non-football related, but good news. Our son had a successful second open heart surgery. The results look real good. We hope this is his last one. He may need a few cath lab procedures down the road, but they think this could be his last open heart surgery. If our little man can fight through two surgeries in 10 months, I do have hope and faith we can beat Miami. So There we and, go. I feel like we should go out on that. I yeah. know I usually say something goofy and dumb at the end of these things going into a weekend, but I don't want to after that. Uh, that's a lot more important, and that's a lot more uplifting anyway. That's right. Check out the pregame show over on our YouTube channel as well as the postgame wrap-up with Gene Williams and Tom Lang. It's a live call-in. Uh, do get involved. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you all on Monday. Go for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. 
Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.